Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce John Hennis, uh, Cardozo class of 96, a uh, partner in the restructuring group in Kirkland and Ellis. Uh, and uh, John has also been tremendously involved with Cardozo since he left us in, in 96. He teaches here as an adjunct uh, professor. In fact, he's teaching next semester. Um, he's also chair of the Heyman Center Advisory Committee and uh, works closely with uh, the center uh, to create programs and events. Uh, a couple of years ago, he did a great uh, series of conferences. Some of you, if you were three L's, were here um, on uh, sovereign debt and really the crisis facing states and municipalities, uh, which uh, unfortunately has all come to pass, uh, at least with respect to Detroit. Um, and. Uh, in 2012, he won the alumni of the uh, alum of the year award um, from the Cardozo Alumni Association. And so, I'm not going to tell you more about his story because I think I'm going to leave it to you, John. Uh, but really, I'm delighted that you're here with us today. Thank you so much for all the help that you provide uh, to the school, to the center, and to to all of us. Thank you. Damaging the visuals. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good, good, good. Um, all right, so this talk actually came out of the Alum of the Year uh, Award, which I'll tell you is, uh, is a pretty amazing thing to, uh, to get. And the reason it's an amazing thing to get is because when you, and I'm sure you guys see this, when you go to school with all of these amazing people, um, and so many of them that graduated with me or graduated before I did um, could have been awarded the alum of the year. To get it is just a very overwhelming experience. It makes you actually look back and think about your life and think about do you really deserve something like that or not. And you kind of say, no, I really don't, but you accept it and you're thankful for it. Um, but when I was sitting with uh, Dean Diller and, and, and Pat uh, for lunch one day before the award, uh, before the event, before the dinner, um, I, I can't remember which one of you asked me, but one of them asked me, how did you get here? Like, how, like what, what's your life story? Um, and so when I told them, they both kind of looked at me, and, and, and it's probably not the typical way that you would get someplace. Um, and they both said, you know, that's a really good story to tell. Now, I don't know if it is or not, and you guys will let me know after this, but um, I'm going to tell it. So let me start with this. Um, ignore that thing. So today, where am I? So first of all, I'm just busy, okay? So I'm married. Uh, Katie knows this. Katie knows my kids. Um, I, uh, sorry, Katie. I, um, I've got four kids. I've got a fifth on the way in March, which is very overwhelming, by the way. Um, and so that's, that in and of itself is busy, and uh, is, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I'm a senior restructuring partner at Kirkland and Ellis. Uh, I worked on some of the most high profile uh, restructurings around, um, you know, leading, leading those cases. We talked about being an alum of the year. Um, I'm on all kinds of different boards and, and um, involved with different organizations. I've been on CNBC and Bloomberg and um, CNN. I publish articles. I do all of these things. Now, why am I telling you this? Right? I'm definitely not telling you this because I want you to be impressed with me um, at all. Um, but I think that if you looked at this, you could say, all right, so John must have done well in school his whole life, must have really worked hard his whole life, must have really focused on you know, just being very uh, ambitious always. Um, and as you'll see, that's completely not true um, and not right. And I think there's lessons in that, hopefully, for everybody. So I want to start with an anecdote or a, a, a quick story. Um, <clears throat> I was a summer associate at Wild Gotcha. And when I was there, uh, after being there for about a month or so, um, I was sitting with my uh, best friend from the summer class. And we were at some event, and we were having a drink. And he looked at me, and he said, I'm really depressed right now. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, look at me. OK, this is him. Um, <laughs> he said, he said I, I, I studied really hard okay, when I was in high school. And I got incredible grades. And I got almost perfect score on my SATs. 
and I went to Harvard, right? The number two college in the entire country, according to U.S. News and World Report. And he said, and then when I was at Harvard, I studied really hard. I got great grades. I got almost perfect LSATs. And I went to Yale Law School. It's the number one law school in the country. And here I am. And he said, you, you were in high school. You played sports, right? You didn't, couldn't even get an 85 average. You got an 1130 on your SATs, and you went to Union College only because you played football. Otherwise, you wouldn't even have gotten in there. And that's the number 41 school in the country. That's liberal arts, so it's probably more like 70 or 80. Um, and then you went to college, and you played a lot of beer pong. You couldn't even get a B average. You got a 159 on your LSATs, and you ended up at Cardozo. Um, and we're here now together. We're here at the same school. He said, so I am depressed. And, I, <laughs> and what I said to him is, it's all about when you peak. And that's what this is going to be about as we walk through this, this presentation today. Okay, so what are some of the lessons that I've learned? Right? And I've learned a bunch of them. So one is that you're not carved in stone. Okay, and so what does that mean? Um, well, here's what it means. When I was growing up, sports is completely what defined me. Okay, I played sports from the, the time that I was, I don't even know, when I came out, when my mother had me. Um, in, in high school, I played football, basketball, baseball, and lacrosse. I went to, I, and I was decent at them. Um, when I was playing sports, I felt good. When I wasn't, I didn't really, there wasn't anything else. It was all sports all the time. I grew up in a little town, um, and literally, I'd go walking down the street, and people would stick their head out to yell, hey, Hennis, gotta, you know, we got to win this weekend. That's what it was all about for me. Um, so that's what defined me. It was it. I knew nothing else. Um, I did do other things, but again, related to sports. So I learned pretty early about it felt good to volunteer, but again, it was because of sports. So um, when I was in high school, we would volunteer at the Special Olympics in the VA hospital, and we would go and do those types of things. So then I sat down to actually, I had to get into college, um, and I took my SATs. And I got a 470 on my verbal SATs, okay? Now, the average New York State verbal score was a 501, and in the U.S. it was a 507. So I was below average, okay, my SATs. Now this is not, I, I, I took Kaplan, I don't know if you guys had Kaplan back then, but I actually took study courses twice, because um, I took the SATs twice and I got a 470 twice. But I was clearly illiterate, right, <laughs> and no vocabulary, um, and, you know, had to go get into school. And again, luckily I played football, so I got into a decent school. Um, what's, so, Obviously, and we'll get into this, but since I'm a lawyer and have to use my words and write and things like that, there, you can overcome anything. Um, change the grade. I don't know if you guys may be too young also, again, for the movie Clueless. I have no idea. No? I don't know. Um, but there's a great scene in Clueless that's always stuck with me where, um, and if you don't know it, so you have Cher, who's the protagonist, and, you know, she's in high school, and her dad, who, Mel, who's a, uh, see, like a, a litigator, um, and, and she comes into the room and he says, you mean to tell me that you argued your way from a C plus to an A minus? Um, and she says, totally, based on my powers of persuasion, you proud. And his answer is, honey, I couldn't be happier than if they were based on real grades, okay? <laughs> so for me personally, when I was um, in high school, I wanted to get a car. It was my sophomore year, I was turning 16, and I said to my dad, you know, I really want to get a car. And he's like, well, look, I, I'm not getting you a car, right? And, and if I did ever get you a car, it would be some old used car because I'm not going to spend a lot of money on it. But you don't deserve one. Like, you don't work. Like, you may play sports, but you don't work. You don't do anything. You don't do well in school. And so after a lot of negotiation, he said, um, all right, fine. If you make honor roll, you can get a car. And to make honor roll at my school, we didn't have letter grades. You needed to, I went to a small public school uh, in Westchester County. You had to get over an 85 average and for overall and nothing lower than an 80. So I got my grades and I was going through them and I got to typing and I had a 79. And I was doing the math and I realized that I had an 85.25 but I had a 79, one point off, so no car. So I went to see my typing teacher and I said, you have to change my grade. Like this is, this is life changing, I need my car. And we argued for a long time and I wore her down and she gave me that 80. And I actually, this right here, I found this this weekend. I don't know why and, or how. This is when I made honor roll. My name's right there. <laughs> it was the one time I made it. Um, in the past. So what's that about? So when I was in college, um, and re let's remember the 470 verbal SATs, 
Um, I didn't work hard in college either. I played football for a couple of years. I got hurt. Then I had no idea what to do because, again, sports defined me. So it was, it was a very kind of weird time, and that's why I started playing beer pong because it was kind of a sport. <laughs> um, but I actually won an academic award. Um, I won for my senior thesis. I won an award for the best writing in Judaica or something like that. And I'm sure there was only one writing in Judaica, and that's why I won. And, it, and my senior thesis wasn't even a thesis, but I didn't realize that because, again, I had no vocabulary. So all I did was trace back my, my family's roots. Um, but anyway, when I got home from college, my father was very proud because I'd never done well academically. And he said, I want to read your senior thesis. I said, great. And I sit on the couch watching TV. I handed it to him. He walked away. 30 seconds later, he came back in, and he threw it at me. And he said, so you, you're here to tell me that I, you wasted all of my money. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're illiterate. You can't write. I mean, this is ridiculous. I said, Dad, I won, a, I won an award. He goes, OK, read the first sentence. So I did. I said, in the past. And he goes, OK. I said, OK, what? And he said, you really don't see anything wrong there. I said, what's wrong there? So he explained to me that that's not the right past. Um, but anyway, what, what it's a lesson of is that it's never too late to develop yourself. And it really isn't. Like, all of these things you're not carved in stone. So no matter where you are now, so long as you focus and you work, and we'll get into some of that, um, you can do anything that you want to do. OK. So right now, you're all sitting here. And I don't know how many of you have jobs, don't have jobs, what you're thinking for the future. But wherever, whatever you are thinking, it's, it's, there's a lot of path to take to get to what's going to make you happy and, and have you be successful. So in college, as I mentioned, sports ended for me. And that was. It was terrible. It was really a difficult thing to deal with. So then I was like, well, what do I do? Okay, and I had no idea. So other than beer pong, like I had like a, a radio show with my friends, rap show too, in the morning. It's like eight o'clock in the morning. It's good, right? They, I was, I was, I probably shouldn't say it like this, but I was drunk one night and my friend had a band and I got up and I sang a song and they were like, wow, you got to do this. You're good. And so for a year, I was the lead singer in a band. Um, <laughs> then I. I, I tried to play once, because when I was in high school, all of the, my friends all did these plays, and I never did, because I was like, it's not cool, and I play sports, I don't do that. But I always kind of was like, ah, oh, it might be fun. So I tried, I didn't really like it, but I tried it on some play, I can't remember what it was. I joined a fraternity late. I, when I, again, I played football, so I was gonna join a football fraternity, then I got hurt, and then I was like, ah, yeah, forget all this, I don't even know if I wanna be in college. Um, but then I joined a fraternity late. And then I started writing, although again, still illiterate, and if you go back and read it, it's. It's bad, but I started writing a little bit for the paper, and it was always, it was always um, provocative things, like things where I would get called into the dean's office, and he would say, "How could you just write this about the school? It's just not true." But I thought it was. Um, but so I sat there and said, "What do I want?" Right. So here I am, graduating from college, and right, what do you do when you graduate from college? You look for a job. Except that's not what I did. Um, all of my friends in the fraternity house, they were either applying to graduate school or they were trying to get jobs at wherever, investment banks or wherever they were going to go. I was just walking around looking for somebody to hang out with. Um, did not look at all for a job. Um, I made a lot of comments about things like I want to go out to, I'll go out to Hollywood and run a movie studio, things, but it was nothing real. It was all this very delusional, weird thing going on in my head. So I get home. And I have no job. Um, my dad throws my senior thesis at me and says, you really have to make some money. So I, you know, what did I do? I went to the local mall, and I got a job at the Gap. And I was a stock boy. Okay? And I sat in a back room folding clothes, which I'm not good at. Um, and and you'll, as you could get good at it, I could. And you'll see. We'll talk about that. But I didn't want to get good at that. Um, then my mother came to me and said, you know, I met this guy, and he's invested in this private television company in New York City, and they have a talk show, and it's on some, like, weird private cable number. It's when, when, never. And, um, and you could be a segment producer, right, which really meant, and it was actually a great job, um, for the talk show, I would go out and figure out what segments would be on. I'd go out and contact people to say, will you come on and, you know, talk about it. So Barbara Corcoran, who you guys may know, Corcoran Group, she was one of our guests. I went out and got her to talk about the real estate market. Um, and then would prepare her, prepare the hosts, and they would do the show. And that was a good job, although they made no money um, and the, the TV company went bankrupt. But um, it was good while it lasted, and I learned a lot from it, um, which we'll get to also. 
Third job, I was a bartender and I was a waiter, right, which is kind of fun for a little while. And then my fourth job was I coached at my high school and was a substitute teacher, which really was a great job. I really did love that. Um, but so what did I learn from that, right? So why do I say there's a lot of paths you can take? Well, I realized things. I did not like being in a back room by myself folding clothes. So that was not going to be my career, right? I liked being around people. Um, I actually liked to lead, right? I liked to be out in front. I liked to take positions. Um, I like to talk, as you can tell. So I would talk a lot. I wanted to, I had to be doing something where I was talking to people, I was getting up in front of people. It's something that I just liked to do. I like broad storylines in life. Like I, as much as lawyers need to be detail oriented, and I can be, that's not what I like about being a lawyer. I like the stories. And in what I do in restructuring, I like the dramas and the stories and being involved in those things. Um, and then this last one, which is a quote from The Great Gatsby, that conduct may be founded on the hard rock or wet marshes, which may, what I'm going to say it means to me, it may not mean, but it, what it means is that, to me, is that in your highs and your lows, you're going to learn a lot and you're going to learn about yourself and, that, and your conduct from that is going to be, is going to be born out of all of those, those, those good times when you're on hard ground and those bad times when you're on soft ground. So everything you guys are doing now, if you stop and you think about it, they're going to lead you down the path that you want. And if you pick the right path, or even if you pick the wrong one, but then make a change, you're going to be able to go find your own way and your own success. Oops, wrong way. OK. So you can do anything. Just take a step. Um, so I was uh, a coach and a substitute teacher. But I did a lot of lying on my couch in my parents' family room and watching TV, right, for two years, a lot of it. Um, and my mother came in one time, and she looked at me. And my mother, just to give some background on this, my mother is my biggest fan, always has been. I can do no wrong, literally no wrong. And she, but she came in, and she finally was like, I can't take it anymore. And she said, you need to do something. You don't have, you don't have to have a plan, but please, please just get up and take a step, just one step forward, okay? She just wanted me to get up and go. Second thing that stuck in my head was Lee Rich, who's my grandfather, and there's a long story to this. It's an interesting story. If any of us have drinks, I can tell you it. But he, um, he happened to be, I didn't know him that well until much later in his life, but he was a very big Hollywood producer. Again, you guys may be too young, but like, Dallas, Walton's, Falcon Crest, Eight is Enough, he, those were all his. Um, and when I, when I said I didn't look for a job in college, which is true, I wrote him a letter. And I said, I'm going to come out to Hollywood because I want to run a movie studio. And I'd love to talk to you um, just to get some advice. And I had met him one time at my bar mitzvah, and then it was a long family story, and he went away. <laughs> Again, we can get into later. But he, uh, and then I called him. I called him every once a week. Um, for probably two or three months. And every time I called, his secretary would say, he's busy, he can't come to the phone. One day he picked up the phone, and I was surprised. And I said, just so you know, I don't want anything from you, but I'm thinking of coming out to Hollywood. All I want is some advice. And he said, you want advice? He said, if you want to run a movie studio, run a movie studio. And he hung up. And to this day, it always, the hanging up doesn't stick with me. But what he said sticks with me because it's, it was, if you want to do something, just go do it. Okay? No one's going to stop you, and also no one's going to give it to you. Just go do it, and you can do it. Um, last thing, and then I'll finish this slide off. I don't know, again, and I keep saying maybe you guys are too young. When I was growing up, TV was very different. So um, you couldn't, you know, you didn't tape things, and you didn't have, you know, um, you couldn't skip commercials, and you couldn't go onto Apple TV and get what you want. Like if there was something on TV, you had to be there for it, and you had to sit down and watch it. And so it became a very much of like a family event. And um, during Christmas time, there was Santa Claus is Coming to Town, which like everybody that's my age has seen it when they were a kid. Um, and there was a song in it about um, put one step in front of the other. But it always stuck with me, and I never knew why. But I, when I was doing this presentation, I know why. And so it's a little silly and a little corny. But you know, if you want to change your direction, if your time of life is at hand, well, don't be a rule. Be the exception. A good way to start is to stand. So. What happened? For me personally, I needed a push. I was on my couch. I had no idea what to do with my life. And I was sitting there saying, how can I get up and do something if I don't know what to do? Um, and really, these three pieces of advice just have always stuck with me, and my mother's especially, which was just get up and take a step. It doesn't matter where you're taking a step. Just move. And so for any of you that are sitting here not sure what to do, just do something. 
right? And if you do it and you don't like it, you'll do something else, but just, just move. It'll work for you. Okay. Um, find your place and time. So this is really just be aware of where you are and what's happening in life. So as my mother told me to take that step, um, two things happened. First, my grandmother called me, and just kind of out of the blue, I got on the phone, and she said, you know, John, I was thinking about you, and I think you need to do something with your life. I'm sure now, thinking back, my mother and grandmother were talking, but at the time, <laughs> I wasn't that perceptive. And she said, you got to do something with your life. Um, and she said, you know what you should do? You should go to law school. She's like, like, she's like you're relatively smart, and you – you know, you could do something, but you'll get that degree, and then you can always, always, like, have it, right? So you'll always have a job, because even if you just go out on your own, you'll have something. So I think you should go to law school. Hung up the phone with her, and then my best friend from college called. He happened to be in law school down in Tulane. And he said, um, he said, you know, I was thinking about you today. I was in this class, and there was this big debate going on in class, and I was thinking about how you would have loved to have been there. You would have loved to have been in the middle of it. I really think you should go to law school. So I took all of that and I said, okay, my mother told me to get up off the couch. My grandmother and my best friend called me on the same day and told me to go to law school, right? It's fate, right? So I'm going to go do it. And so I did. And I got into Cardozo. Now, I didn't know anything about law schools. I didn't really focus on it. I just applied and Cardozo happened to be the school that I got into. So I came here. And I walked in, I guess a long time ago, um, August of 1993. And a number of things happened. Um, when I got there. Um, and, and if anyone was at the alumni dinner, you'll have heard some of this, but one thing that happened was uh, I met my wife, right? So first day I walked in, we had our little orientation and there was um, four students that got together and I was sitting there and I saw this woman walking towards me, or she was really a girl at the time, but um, <laughs> walking towards me and I was like, wow, she's really cute and liked her and liked her instantly, and she didn't like me. She told me that I was not attractive. Um, <laughs> she told me I was nice, but not her type, but I told her she was wrong. Um, and it didn't take me that long. It took like a month, but I, I convinced her. But Pam, who's my wife, um, she was not like me. She was focused. You know, she, she went to Dartmouth undergrad. She always did well in school. She worked hard. She understood that what the real world was like. She understood that if you did well in school, you could go get a job. I didn't know that. Um, and so she really pushed me to work. Um, and I also had a couple of other people in a study group. And we really, really worked hard. I'll get into that in a second. But they, that, that kind of transformed me. It was the first time I, I walked into Cardozo literally saying, I can't do well because I'm not smart. I'm just not. I've never done well. Like, I'm fine. I'm not dumb. But I'm just like an average whatever. I can't do well. But it, it, things work out, right? I was always optimistic. And my wife said, you're wrong. You are smart. You're kind of dumb because you think you're not, but you're smart. And you just need to work. You just never actually focus on anything. So work. Um, second thing was the dean at the time, Dean Macchiarola, who unfortunately passed away recently, um, I got to know him well. And he took a real interest in me. And when I write here, there will only be a few. What I mean by that is there's going to be a lot of people that you will meet along the way. And there'll be people that will help you, and there'll be people that don't want to help you, and there'll be people that you think are your friends, and some of them are. But there's only going to be a handful of people at most that will really stand behind you, that will think about you when, when you're not even thinking about yourself. And he was one of those people for me. Um, and he just taught me so much. So he taught me that if you work hard, you can do great things. He told me to strive, taught me to strive high. Um, he taught me to speak out for what I believed in. Um, and he was there you know, for anything that I needed to help me out. So find those people, right? And if you find one, hold on to them because they're going to be important to you. And then, as you guys know, we have great professors at this school. And I can tell you that when I left and went out to law firms, I realized that the education that I got was so much better and so much stronger than other people did at schools that people would say are better. And I would question whether any of those schools truly are better. I don't think they are. I just think they have different names. Um, but the professors here are amazing. Um, and, and most of them are. And if you, so you want to, you want, you're going to learn from them and you're going to learn things. And the new, uh, just to pump you up a little bit, um, uh -huh. Dean Diller and this new iTrans program, right? And um, which is going to be hands on transactional preparation. Things like that are going to teach you so much. So if you do want to do transactional work and you have the opportunity to do it, you should do it because it's going to teach you. And then when you do step out, no matter what you do, you're going to be that much more prepared than other people. 
Um, <clears throat> and then the last thing, and this is just because I'm a huge, huge, huge Bruce Springsteen fan, and so I always have to put him into any presentation. Um, this is from Badlands, working in the field till you get your back burned, working beneath the wheels till you get your facts learned. That's what life's all about, okay? Right? You gotta, you've got to, you've got to work, and it's gonna hurt, right? And you've got to, you've got to get under there and learn. And if you work hard and you learn, you can really do anything that you want. Okay. So now I'm in law school. My wife, not at the time, we didn't get married until after law school, who told me I could do well. Um, so I worked hard, right? And first semester, or yeah, first semester of law school, I worked very hard. I studied nonstop. And I only had a couple of midterm exams, right? It was mostly final, so you didn't have anything. Um, and one of them was on civil procedure. And I studied so hard, so hard. Um, and my wife, um, she didn't study hard. And the reason she didn't study hard is because she got mono, not from me. So I don't know who she was kissing, but it wasn't me. <laughs> um, but she, um, she didn't study at all. And the night before the exam, she was sitting there and she didn't feel well. And I went over to her apartment and she was like, I'm going to fail. I didn't study. And I said, I'll teach it to you. And we sat there and I taught her the entire semester. Um, and we went in and we took the test and we walked out and I said, that was so easy. And she said, that was so hard. And then we went away and we came back um, and sat down and the blue books came back. You guys, I don't know if you use blue books anymore. No. Okay. So blue books, they're little blue books, right in. Um, and we got the blue book back and I was so excited because I was like, this is the first time I'm ever going to do well on an exam. I'm so psyched. I've never seen a good grade. And I opened it up and it was a big C minus. And there was a red line literally through my entire thing that just said irrelevant. And I was shocked. And I looked over at her and she had this like weird look on her face. And then we got out and she's like, how'd you do? I said, how'd you do? And she's like, I got an A. I was like, it figures. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, so I went to see my professor and I said, I don't get it. I was like, I know everything. And he said, yeah, you do. You know everything. You wrote to me everything that I taught you. He said, but you didn't answer the question. Not once did you answer the question. You just wrote what you knew. And he's like, it's critical to be able to answer the question. All right? And so I learned from that. I said, OK, I need to learn how to take a test. I need to learn how to read the questions and answer the questions. Um, and so what I did is I worked even harder. Right? And I really I, I dug in as deep as I could dig in. And I decided I was going to give it everything I could. And either I was going to do well or I wasn't. But I wasn't going to walk away saying that um, I didn't give it my all. And so we studied, um, my wife, again, Pam, and our two other people in our study group. And we, we studied, and we took practice exams. And I practiced and practiced and practiced. I remember on, and I know it's kind of weird that I remember these things, but I remember like in property, we, we took all these practice exams. And what we realized was that there were like 12 issues that the professor hit. And so we made a checklist. And what happened is that he had three questions, so you'd have four, you know, four of those issues on each one. And when we took the exam, I sat there and I got to that last question. And I said, oh, all right, I've already gotten eight done, so here are the four issues I need to do. I didn't even know what, like, I couldn't figure out where one of the issues fit in, but I just wrote about it anyway, right, and, and did well. And so I ended up being, fortunately, in the top 10 percent of my class and graded on the law review because there's no way I could have ever written on the law review. Um, and when I got on law review, you know, and, and look, and this for me is hard because, like, I grew up, like I said, I was like, I played sports, I liked girls, and that's it, okay? So being like a kind of geeky law school guy was not something that I ever thought that I would have been, but I got on the law review and I said, you know what? I'm gonna work hard here too. Like, I wanna publish a note, um, I wanna do well. Okay, so publishing a note. So I sat there and I wrote my note, and I worked at it for a long time. And I remember for weeks just sitting there reading it over and over again and polishing it and making it perfect. And I handed it in. And the, um, the editor-in-chief of the law review, a guy named Steve Washington, called and said, hey, John, can I see you? I said, sure. I was all pumped up, going to get my note published. This is great. And he sat me down and he said, you know, John, you got to take this stuff seriously, OK? Like, <laughs> you really need to, like, when you hand something in, you've got to focus on it. You can't, like, do it the night before. And I said, um, OK and walked out and was like, what in the world's going on? And I realized I could not write. Like, I just, I never learned um, grammar. I had no vocabulary. I thought what I was writing was good, but it was clearly not good. And so I worked with my editor nonstop. And I, my topic was 
ridiculously dumb, right? I just saw it the other day. I was talking to Chris Greco, who's my partner, about it. We were laughing. But all I wanted to do was publish that note because I wanted to get it done. And I did. And I was proud of that. It didn't make me a better writer because I think my editor really ended up writing it, but I worked really hard to do it. And then I was, ended up being managing editor of the Law Review, which again, which I got not because I could write or anything else, it's because I got along with people, right? People liked me, I would not be afraid to stand up and lead, and so I got that. Interviewing. So now you're going out to interview, right? And I don't know how many of you are interviewing or getting ready to interview for jobs, um, <clears throat> but what I did was I practiced. I practiced interviewing. I thought of every question that anybody could ever ask me in an interview, and I practiced my answers. Um, and when I say practice is personal, it's because I really think that's true. I think preparation is personal too. So I would get up, the way that I practice, I do this for hearings also, I did this for today. I just get up and I talk to myself. That's what I do. I walk around my kitchen, my kids laugh at me, my wife laughs at me, right? But I get up and I just talk because that's how I remember things well. I don't remember them by writing them down and reading them, I remember by talking. So I would literally just stand there and think of questions and I would just talk it out nonstop. Um, and it gave me confidence, and it really gave me confidence once I started interviewing because there were times where I would be sitting in an interview bored, like just hearing the same question over again, and I could hear myself giving the answer even though I wasn't thinking about it, and I realized at that point in time that I just, I could, any question they threw at me would just come out. And I didn't, I could be, I was so prepared, I was over prepared. Um, and so when you guys are getting ready for interviews or you're getting ready for a presentation or you're doing anything like that, Find your own way to practice, but practice, and practice enough where you know what you're going to do is just second nature, that you don't have to think about it anymore, that it's just part of you. Um, and if you can do that, you're going to have the confidence to be able to go do and accomplish what you would like. All right. Um, so you can do it if you do it your own way. There's no one way to do anything. Um, there's, you know, as you can tell from my, you know, where I came from, I mean, like, you, you just have to find your own way and at your own time. So when I went and I was a summer associate at Wild well, Gotcha, um, and I'll admit this, I was intimidated. I walked in and we had a 40 or 50 summer associates and they were from Harvard and Yale and Columbia um, and NYU. And I was like, wow, these people are smart. These people have worked their whole life. I'm an imposter. Like, who am I? Like, I, I did well one, you know, one year in school and that's it and probably got lucky a little bit. How am I going to do this? And so when I walked into Wild Gotcha, and you know, summer associate jobs are fun, and I had a lot of fun, but I worked hard. And what I did first, and I should have written this, but it's important, the first assignment I got, I told myself I was going to do it perfectly. I was going to do it, it was going to be the best assignment anyone had ever done. And my view was that if I handed that assignment in, and that partner read it, and that partner said, wow, this guy's good, they're going to go into a room, because this is what they do, and they talk about people, and they'd say, wow, this Hennis guy's really good. And that would be it. I would get the benefit of the doubt for the whole summer, right? That's all I needed to do. And so I worked hard, and I handed that in, and I did a good job on it, and that's what happened. I was all of a sudden, I was one of the stars of the class, and I could do no wrong, and then all they wanted to do was take me out. I didn't even have to work anymore, right? And that's a good place to be, by the way. Um, but it's, I focused on my strengths, right? My, my strengths were really, again, just getting along with people. I went in and people had confidence in me, right? And I walked around, even if I didn't feel it all the time, not cocky, because you never want to walk around cocky, but I walked around being like, okay, I do belong here, even if I didn't think that I did. Um, and I was friendly to people. Being friendly and polite is, goes so far in life. Just saying thank you to people and saying please and reaching out and helping somebody from time to time, one, it makes you feel good. Second, it makes the person feel good. And third, it's just good karma at the end of the day. Um, but here I was, and I think a lot of you guys are probably thinking this too, what should I do, right? Do I do litigation? Do I do corporate? If I do corporate, what type of corporate? Should I do tax? Right? I had no idea. I didn't know anything. And so the only thing I thought I wanted to do was M&A. And I thought I wanted to do M&A because in corporations, I read all the cases about the, um, you know, the, the takeover guys and going in and taking over a company, and it seemed really exciting to me. So I was on a subway, on the subway going to work, reading the paper, and there was an article that Wild Gotcha was representing Westinghouse in the Westinghouse CBS merger, this big merger that was taking place. So I got to the office and I called the, um, the summer person and said, I really want to, uh, I, I want to work on this matter. And she, so she said, great, uh, here's the partner you should go meet with. So I went to meet with the senior partner. 
Um, and I sat down and I was like, all right, what are we doing? Let's go. Let's get moving. This is great. I'm really excited. And he goes, okay, here's what's happening. He said, so the business people are over at um, CBS's offices and they're meeting right now. Okay. And they're going to call us when the deal's done. And what we need to do is we need to focus on some of the, the documents and some of these details. And I said, well, why aren't we in the business meeting? He's like, well, because we're the lawyers. And I was like, okay, that sucks. That doesn't sound good. Um, and so I sat there, like, looking at reps and warranties in this agreement. And I was bored out of my mind. And I was like, this is not what I'm going to do. Right? I think it is. There are people that love doing it. It wasn't for me. Then I, this restructuring, bankruptcy thing. I didn't know anything about it. The only reason that I even um, tried it was because another Cardozo grad, uh, who was a year senior to me, who was at Weill, said, um, they're really fun people. So, okay. And I sat on their floor. And I went and did an assignment. And Harvey Miller, who is literally the king of bankruptcy, I mean, he's probably 80 now, still working, better shape than every one of us in this room, um, but really created modern day bankruptcy. Um, I went to a meeting with him. And he, unlike the corporate partner, he was the meeting. He was in the middle of it. He was the one directing it and leading it. You know, the CEO of the company was looking to Harvey for what do I do now? All of the creditors were looking to Harvey to saying, okay, where, how are we negotiating? When are we starting this? And I said, based on my personality, that's what I want to be. I want to be in the middle. I want to be the person that's standing up and, and leading things. I'm not going to be the person who's sitting behind the scenes just drafting things. It's just not who I am. I won't be happy doing that. But getting up and walking into a room and being able to bring people together, that's something I could do. Um, and then in restructurings, it's very chaotic because, you know, you have a company that's not doing well. There's only so much value. You have all these creditors that are you know, all want their piece of value, um, and you've got to create some order out of that. And that's something that I thought that I could be good at and was something that interests me. And with four kids, bless you, with four kids, I'm very good now at taking chaos. Actually, because I'm actually not that good at it. You can ask, ask my daughter this morning when I told her she should go to boarding school because she wouldn't listen to me. Um, turn weakness into strength. Okay. So, when you're thinking about your future and the skills that you need, like what, what are they, right? And again, thinking about what interests you, what your passions are, what you're good at, what you want to be good at, and then things that you're not good at but that will be helpful, right? So for me, one was speaking in public, okay? Um, and I put this Jerry Seinfeld quote, and I won't read it exactly, but I always thought it was funny, right, where he says that, you know, they did this study and um, they found that, well, I will read it to be better. According to most studies, people's number one fear is public speaking. Number two is death. Death is number two. Does that sound right? This means to the average person, if you go to a funeral, you're better off in the casket than doing the eulogy. Okay? And I, my, my example of that was Dean Macchiarola again. When he retired, they had this big cocktail party for him. And he asked if I would say a few words about him. So I said, of course. I was very, you know, I was humbled and honored to, that he wanted me to get up and say something. So I worked really hard on this short little toast for him, and I was waiting my turn. And as I realized it was going to be my turn, I couldn't breathe. My heart was literally jumping out of my chest. I, I couldn't swallow. I, I thought I was going to faint. It was this terrible, terrible experience. And I had to get up, though. And so I got up. And I stared right at him, and I just said my toast as fast as I could say it, and then sat down. I don't think anybody even knew what I said. And I was embarrassed, and I, was, I really I felt terrible about it. And I said to myself, I'm never going to feel like that again. And so I have two choices. I can never get up and speak again, or I can work at it. Okay? And I decided I was going to work at it. And I worked on everything. And by the way, even today sitting here, when I was sitting there and, and, and the dean was introducing me, I felt my heart start beating a little bit. Right? I started being like, all right, I'm a little nervous. I got to get up and talk in front of these people. What if they don't like me? What if they think this sucks, right? I mean, and then I said, I don't really care. And so <laughs> I'll just get up and just do it. Um, and then learning to write. Obviously, we, this is the theme, uh, how bad, right, a writer in the past, right? I do now know why that's wrong. Um, my law review note. But what I did was, again, I realized if I, were gonna, if I was going to be a lawyer, if I was going to be anything, I had to learn how to write, right? I mean, so there was a partner at Weill who I worked with a lot. And I would hand him my memos or pleadings, and he would mark them up in this red pen. And I would, and a lot of people, what they did is they would take that and they'd hand it to their secretaries, and their secretaries would make the changes. They'd read it once more, fix it up, and then hand it back. What I did is I took it and I typed it all in myself. And I would sit there and I would think about it. And then I started to imitate him. He was a good writer. And I literally got to the point 
where I could write exactly like him. Like you would not know who is writing which pleading. Um, and then once I got comfortable with that, then I said, okay, now it's time for it to be me. So I personalized it. Um, and now I write in my own way. Um, and it, it is my writing. When I put something out there, it is completely, you know, John Hennis. And so I think the lessons here is that you're, there's going to be things, there are things that you're bad at, right? And, there, and there's things that you're bad at that don't matter, you'll never do, right? Folding clothes, I'm never going to do that, right? And if I do, they'll be wrinkled and I don't care. But um, for me, speaking in public, writing well, that was very important to me. Um, and I had to work really hard to get there. And so just know that if there's something now that you don't think you are good at, it's not that you're not good at it, it's just that you haven't worked hard enough yet. And if you put the work in, you'll be able to do it well. Okay. Be in the arena, and, and, and this Theodore Roosevelt quote, which I cut down because I couldn't fit it all on the page, is probably a little bit of a cliche, but I think it's true, right? Um, and what he's talking about, what, if you see the entire quote, and if you've never looked at it, you should read it, it's a great quote. But he basically is saying, get into the arena. Get in there and get bloody and get muddy and give it your all and do your best. Um, and even if you fail, at least you were there. At least you were trying. And then you'll get up and you'll wash yourself off and you'll try again. Um, and for me, I, you know, I, I think I finally did that. For a long time, I wasn't. I was in no arena. I was sitting on a couch watching TV. I was you know, walking around my fraternity house trying to figure out why people were trying to get jobs. It just, you know, it was... It was um, I, I was, uh, to say lost, I don't want to say that because it sounds like a little bit too, uh, uh, I don't know, um, psychological maybe, but I wasn't there, but I got there. And I went to Wild Gotchall, and when I was at Wild Gotchall, I threw myself in. I wanted to work on every case that I could work on. They all seemed interesting to me, um, and I worked hard. And then <clears throat> um, during the whole dot-com boom, I, I was, I won't tell the full story, but I basically left Wild Gotchall and tried to start my own company. And I did that for about... Um, 18 months and I went out and raised a whole bunch of money and hired a whole bunch of people and hired these software developers um, and then the world collapsed and NASDAQ crashed and raising more money and was just not doable and my wife got pregnant with our first child um, and so I had to do something okay but going back to that but when I look back the lessons I learned from that I, I so don't regret it because I took the chance right I jumped in and I said okay I'm going to go try to do this. And, it, and I did fail, and it didn't work. And I never really even had a business. And truthfully, I was delusional in many ways. My wife always used to say, how can you call it a business if you don't make money? Isn't that the purpose of a business? And I was like, no, you don't understand what you're talking about. It's not about making money. It's about other things. Um, and then when I left, I said, well, what am I going to do now? I said, well, I don't want to be a lawyer. right? I tried that already. I really liked this whole like entrepreneurial thing. So I need to find something else to do, but I need something stable because now I'm going to have uh, a kid and I got to be able to pay for that, that child. Um, so I went back and said, okay, I'll go to a law firm, I'll do it for a year, and then I'll figure out what to do next. And when I was interviewing with law firms at Kirkland and Ellis, the Kirkland and Ellis culture is entrepreneurial. Um, so I, and the, the guy who um, still runs, he basically runs our firm now, um, he told me, he said, you know, John, we've got four people in New York that do restructuring. I want to grow it. And you can be part of it. You can be the guy on the ground floor. Um, and the four we have aren't really that good, and they're probably not going to be around, and they're not. Um, but go build it. We want to build New York. And so I said, okay, I'll try this. And, and to Pam, I said, I'm going to do it for a year. Um, well, now it's almost 13 years later, and I'm still there. And we went from those four, and now we have, what, 40 in New York? Um, so everything he told me was true, and we did. I'm sorry, that's Chris Greco. He's a partner of mine at Kirkland. Um, and we, we grew it, right? But, I, again, I went in, and I jumped in, and I was in there, in the arena, taking chances, trying things, right, that, that don't regret. So CNBC, um, when, the, when, the, when the world collapsed in 2007, um, a friend of mine who used to run CNBC called me up, and he said, I have two questions for you. Have you ever written for you know, any, anything non-legal, and have you ever been on TV? And I said no to both. And he said, okay, I want to try to do both of those things because we need somebody who can talk about bankruptcy because that's all, that's all anybody's talking about now, and so we want you to try it. And I did, and I, you know, and, and yeah, the first time you go on TV, it's, it's nerve-wracking and exciting and weird, um, but it was great, and I, was, I wasn't sure I should do it, but I, I decided to try it, and I decided to, um, you know, start writing, and, uh, which I also found that I really enjoyed. 
and uh, teach the Cardozo class. And when I say do good, and then jump in and try to just help people, right? Like try to give back, right? And when I think, again, I think there's only a few people that really have, have been completely behind me, and, and that's understandable. But I've also watched people, you know, um, give their heart and souls to charities, right? And work hard. And so when people call me up and say, will you make a donation? If it's a friend that I know is really given it, they're all to something, I always write that check. I'm always there because I just think it's the right thing to do. And so I've gotten involved with all of these organizations. But get involved with things. You learn from all of them. You meet people, right? You do good, and it does good for you too, right? I mean, there is a, a give and take. There is a quid pro quo in some ways, and that's probably too strong. But when you go out and you do these things and you meet people, they will open up doors for you as well. All right, so I started off saying it's all about when you peak. but it's not completely true because, you know, if I, if I got to the point when I was a summer associate and that's when I peaked, then I wouldn't be standing here right now, right? It's, it's about you got to keep peaking, right? You never stop peaking. Um, and so just a few things on these quotes. Um, this first quote, you know, about, and I'll read it just in case people can't see it, we should not judge people by their peak of excellence, but by the distance they have traveled from the point where they started, okay? So, I'll give an example. I was, again, I was talking with Chris about this this morning. If you're, let's say you're, you come from an incredibly wealthy, well-connected family, right? Um, okay, but you're, you're, you're the daughter of Barack Obama. I hope you go to Harvard. I hope, right, if that's where you want to go, because you will. You're going to get in, okay? If you want to go get a job at Goldman Sachs, you're going to get that job at Goldman Sachs. You don't have to do anything because you just happen to be the president's daughter. Okay, so you could sit there and say, wow, that's really impressive. She's at Goldman Sachs, but she's, it's not that impressive, right? It's, what would be impressive is, you know, a kid that grew up with nothing, that worked and clawed and fought his way for everything that he could, and now he's at Goldman Sachs or she's at Goldman Sachs. That's impressive. So don't just look at somebody and where they are and assume, right, okay, this person is great, right? Look at where people have come from and where they've gone. And then once you get there, you can't stop. Right? It's real easy to stop. It's real easy to say, I'm, I'm real proud of myself now. But if you do that, you're not going to be proud of yourself later. You've got to keep fighting. And John Wooden in this quote just says, it takes real character to keep working as hard or even harder once you're there. And John Wooden was UCLA's basketball coach forever and one of the best, not just basketball coaches, but it, he's got books that if you ever need inspiration and, and just kind of a direction in life, it's worth going you know, and downloading a book and reading it. But it's really hard once you've made it, right, in your mind to keep working because you said, well, I've already made it. But you've never made it because if you stop, then it's, it, it's over. Um, this yesterday's gone, the road is calling, today is the day, which is a Boston Don't Look Back um, song. That's what I would say to all of you. Like, here you are, you're on law school. The whole world is open to you. You can do anything that you want, right? So, like, the road is calling. I mean, it's calling for you. So just go out there right and do it and today's the day to start doing it um this one's not a quote i just wrote this but and and i'll use this with respect to the alumni dinner um the award dinner right achieving success is gratifying right and the recognition of success by others is overwhelming and it is right you achieve something you feel good about yourself and you should right if you worked hard and you achieved something you should feel good about yourself you can pat yourself on the back a little bit and then when other people recognize it that's a great feeling it's an amazing feeling um but it goes away, right? So when I finished, when that dinner, it was one of the best nights of my life. There's no question about it. Because it was incredible to get the honor. It was incredible to stand up and see all of my friends, my family, my colleagues all there, you know, wanting to be there with me, wanting to share in that. Um, and I got up and I got to give a little speech and it felt great. And then I woke up the next morning and it was gone, right? Because what was I going to do next? And if I wasn't ready to go and take the next step, I would have sat there and, and felt bad. And it happens to people. It happens all the time. So you can never stop. You just have to keep going. And then this book, by the way, uh, Carol Dweck, I, I know it's a terrible last name, but um, she wrote a book called Mindset. She's uh, at Stanford. And it, I would recommend it to everybody. It's, it's, it's a life-changing book. Um, but she said, becoming is better than being, right? And I think that's, that's what it's all about. Like, it's not just about being. It's what are you going to become? Right? So you want to go out there and try things, take the risks. Okay. Last one. We're almost done. So aim high, throw your hat in the ring, and no regrets. Okay? So yesterday is yesterday, right? And it is. You can't do anything about what happened yesterday. It happened. It's 
done. It's gone, right? So you may have done the worst thing in the world yesterday. Okay, well, you can't do anything about it. You can't go back and change it. You can only change what you're going to do now, okay? There's always time, right? I, I could imagine sitting, you know, in your shoes, um, and I don't know, for instance, I don't know who's done really well. I don't know who has jobs already and who doesn't have jobs and who's sitting there feeling discouraged, but it's not too late. Like, there's always time to go do something great, or not even great. There's always time to just get started. Um, and when you should start, you should start now. You don't, again, I know I said this, but you don't need to know where you're going, right? Just go take a step. Go try something. Start walking down a path, right? If you get blocked, you'll go a different way, but at least you'll get moving, and you'll definitely learn along the way. Um, it's not about doing what's easy. It's about what's doing. It's about doing what's hard, right? Easy stuff is always going to be easy for you, okay? For me, like with sports, it was easy. Now, I should have worked harder. I could have been better if I had worked harder, but growing up in my small town, it was almost too easy for me, right? And, and I never had to work, right? But it's about doing the hard work, right? That's, and that's where like the fulfillment will come also, is when you actually sit back and you say, this is really hard for me, right? Like I will tell you, getting up here and being able to talk in front of all of you, when I say something and you guys all laugh, that feels good because I couldn't have done that before. You could have laughed at me, but it would have been for a very different reason. Um, and, it's, and it was hard though. It was hard to be able to do that. Um, and there are, so there's no shortcuts. Um, it, life is really long, okay? It, it's, 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 I mean, it's cliche to say, but it's a marathon. It is not a sprint. Like we all want things and we want things now and that's okay and we should get certain things now. But at the end of the day, it's a long life, right? It just keeps going. Um, follow your passion. Right? Persevere and think long term. Think about what you really love. Think about what you love to do. Think about who you are. Think about what gets you up in the morning and makes you feel good and follow that, right? Because then you're going to be happy. You're going to be successful, right? People do. They try to follow the money, right? Because you, you walk around and you say, oh, I want things. But at the end of the day, you, you can have things. They're not, they, certain things will make you happy at, for a certain period of time. But it's following your passion. It's feeling good when you wake up in the morning. It's wanting to get out of bed and go to your job or wanting to get out of bed and go be with your kids or with your friends. I mean, you want to, you got to follow your passion and just work through it and just keep working um, to make that part of your life. And then the effort will be worth it. Um, it is. It's, it's all worth it. When you work hard and you achieve certain success, it's worth it. You look back and you feel good. Now, I'll go back to, right, that you never want to stop peaking. So it feels good. And again, you should pat yourself on the back and you should feel good about it. But then you got to keep stepping forward. So I think that's all I have to say. Um, so anyway, that's what I have to say. And I'm happy to answer questions or if you have comments or critiques or thoughts, all of those things, um, I'm here as long as you want me to be. Thank you. Thank you for that remarkable story. Questions, comments? And if you don't have any, that's fine, too. <laughs> no, no, they'll have some. Okay. Won't you? <laughs> yeah, have. Uh, well, I guess the question just is, as you continue to go along, you now have uh, almost five kids, plus uh, a speaking arrangement today, plus your own work. So what, how have you managed to balance these things in your life since you've gotten more and more involved and complicated so you can continue to be successful in what you want to do? Yes, uh, it's a good question. It's, it, I don't think I think about it that much. It's, um, no, I'm serious. It's, you know, I got to a point in my life where I obviously started out not being very sedentary, right? And then once I started to move and I started to see that it felt good to move and to do things, and um, I just wanted to keep doing it. So when I wake up in the morning now, I do generally have a million things on my calendar, um, and it's sometimes hard to keep them straight. And so one, you know, I, I, for me, I wake up in the morning with my kids every morning unless I'm away. Um, and that's my real, that's my weekday specific time with them. I wake them up, right? I help get them dressed. I get them fed. I sit with them. I talk to them about what their day is going to be like. I get them on the bus. Um, I kiss them goodbye. And that, that hour in the morning means a lot, right, to me. And it means a lot to them. And then, you know, it's harder at night just from what I do because I'm generally like going out and meeting people for drinks or dinner and networking and doing all of those things. Um, and then weekends are all about the family and all about the kids. 
work, you know, you have work and clients, and I'm sure I've got, you know, literally 20 emails from different clients asking where I am and because they, they need me. One thing is to know they rarely ever really need you when they think they need you. Um, you got to, you, you need to let them think that you're always there for them. Um, but at the same time, like, there's things, I wanted to be here today. I wanted to do this. I wanted to try this today, right? I've never actually gotten up and spoken about something like this before, um, and I wanted to try it, and it was worth it to me to take some time out of my schedule. So I think in terms of balancing it, you got to find your own way, um, but just don't sleep. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Good. Thank you very much.